Ladies and Gentlemen, willkommen zurück bei der Konferenz. Ladies and Gentlemen, the second panel will mainly deal with the European youth and the youth labor market in Europe. So we will have a hopefully lively discussion, not only on the panel, but also with you. I shortly introduce my guests to you. I start with uh, Ilaria Maselli. She works with the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels and is an expert in labor market questions. Reinhard Bütikofer, member of European Parliament, with the Green Party and also in leading functions with the Green Party European movements. Um, Marcelina Zawisza, she's a journalist and activist in Warsaw, in Poland. And Michalis Gudis, he's uh, working with the, um, he's communication officers with the gig holders. You should explain in detail what that is. It's um, housing Uh, it, it, it's a society which deals mainly with social housing and social building. He's also in Brussels. And my name is Ursula Weidenfeld. I'm an economic journalist in Berlin. Ilaria, talking about solidarity, is talking about Europe's youth and talking about labor market seems to be Uh, there, there seems to be some, something common and, and very widespread um, uh, thinking about that, that uh, the use is the lost generation for Europe and that unemployment is uh, very, very high and that uh, this is our, the, the main problem is to solve these problems. Would you agree with that? Um, is this on? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ursula. Um, Well, I know there is a huge attention towards youth unemployment. Um, and in the past three or four years, it has been making the headlines um, of newspapers in many, many countries. Uh, now, there are two journalists around the table, so I, I should be careful not blaming them. <laughs> Because already... Three I, journalists. <laughs> three. Okay. Uh, already I'm going to say something very unpopular, so I have to be careful here. Um, but what I, the point I would like to make is that uh, once you look at the statistics, and I think policies should be based on you know, evidence uh, and data, uh, what you realize is that there is no youth unemployment problem in Europe. There is, there is an important labor market problem uh, in, in many European countries, uh, not in the one where we are today. But we, we do have unemployment rates of 50%, for example, in Spain, haven't uh, we? That is... Okay... Uh, it's a problem of definition. Uh, when you take the unemployment rate uh, and you say an, an youth unemployment rate of 50%, that does not mean that one in two youth is uh, unemployed. Uh, because um, when, you, when you calculate the unemployment rate, what you take is not the overall population of youth, but you only take those that are active. And, uh, well, youth unemployment rates are normally calculated on youth that are aged between 15 and 24. So if, if you start looking at those numbers, I mean, it doesn't make sense to say 50% unemployment rate. First of all, you have to consider that many of these people are still in education. So especially the cohort between 15 and 19 years of age, um, 80 to 90% of them in all countries are still in school, and likely so. Um, and similar for the following cohort, the one between 20 and 24 years, um, around 30% or 40% of those young people are still in university, and again, rightly so. Um, so once you, once you start counting how many people are unemployed in their overall population, uh, what you realize is, is that on average in Europe there are 12 every 100, and not 50. Um, then, of course, there are variations in the different countries. Uh, there are very few um, in, uh, in Germany, like 9 every 100, Uh, a bit more in Italy, for example, 15 every 100, um, and 29 in Spain. So in a couple of countries, Spain and, uh, and Greece in particular, the number is very high. But if you look at this in general in Europe, there is no youth unemployment problem, in my so opinion. And, and what would you suggest to do with the even when smaller but even problematically group of you young people? What, what would you, su you should suggest? Um, well... S leaving aside, um, let's say, uh, labor market policies, I think youth have two uh, options which are often much more difficult for um, older unemployed people. Um, one, of, one is education, 
um, and this is, uh, you know, this is a kind of insurance against unemployment over your whole life because normally if you, if you have tertiary education, you have an employment probability of 80%, um, 85, even 90. And this is everywhere, uh, everywhere in Europe. It's very high everywhere. And the second option is mobility. So if you're young, it's much easier compared if you have a family and you're unemployed at the age of 40 to just start a new life in another region of your country or in another country in Europe. Michalis, would you agree to that? <laughs> <laughs> I am really willing to agree that there is no youth unemployment in Europe, uh, problem in Europe, although almost... She didn't say there's no problem. She said there the is problem is probably problem. a little bit overdone. It's, there's a labor market problem instead of a youth unemployment problem, although the EU policies now are focusing on the youth unemployment problem and they're trying to find different solutions on that. All right, I'm going to accept that uh, the youth is not excluded from employment or from the labor market, but I'm going to tell you that the youth is excluded from education more and more right now. I'm going to tell you with two examples, one from Spain, where there is this amazing scheme, adopt a student, where students are given motives to find a sponsor to pay for their studies. I'm going to tell you that only yesterday in Brussels, the major, the rectors of the major Greek universities held a press conference explaining how difficult the situation is in the Greek universities and the fact that they are not able anymore to move on uh, with the, uh, the, the Greek universities' uh, function. So there is a problem with education, which is the step before employment and labor market, and there is an even bigger problem from our aspect, from Second House Housing Europe, which is the European Federation for Social Housing, the most fundamental right that a person has in his life, according to the UN and to the EU institutions, is the right to housing, to affordable and decent housing. I would tell you with numbers, because we love the uh, numbers, that 60% of youth in Spain still live with their parents. How independent is that? How can someone then have a normal life, go on with job hunting and everything in his uh, daily life? And not to mention Greece. There, there's not just a problem about youth living with their parents. There are now people of 40 or 45 years old still going back to their parents' places because of the complexity of crisis. Marcelina, the European Union recently made up a six billion fund to um, make young people be more connected to the labor market, to help them find jobs, to help them find education. Um, is the, the money rightly invested? Is it rightly dedicated to mm. the different groups? Uh, I think that European Union su should support uh, finding jobs for young people, but uh, it's not what they supposed to do. It's just one thing uh, that um, it's, it's a drop in the ocean. Uh, we are a generation who is um, not participating in social security systems and we cannot benefit from it because our, um, we don't have like proper jobs. We have only contracts more and more so this is a problem uh, maybe there is not non, um, maybe there is not a problem of uh, youth unemployment uh, maybe there is a problem of uh, labor market but the people who have a job they have uh, really um, uh, sorry i just uh, they have a problem uh, with the uh, uh, um, with that they don't have uh, the, this proper job, they have only contracts and they cannot participate, uh, they cannot feel secure, they have a problem of uh, insecurity and uh, they can always lo lose their jobs, they have, uh, uh, they have uh, is, uh, is no... Is, is that a problem and a question of um, solidarity within Europe or is it a question about solidarity within generations? The parents' generations do have all this security in their jobs and social insurances and things like that. They could make up their families, their own lives. I uh, think it's both. Because, um, first of all, uh, it's a problem of European Union because uh, the countries are letting 
uh, taking our social rights. Uh, and they are um, doing everything to um, make us more flexible and uh, agree to uh, have uh, worse contracts with every single uh, year. Um, for example, in Poland, it's very, uh, very popular to have a contracts that uh, allow you to fire people from uh, one day to, to, to an another. You can just uh, go to work and find out that you are not working anymore. Uh, so uh, this is a problem, like um, we are giving up uh, something that um, uh, worker movement fought, fought for, for a really long time and we're just giving it up as a European Union as a whole. Uh, and this is a problem of a genera uh, of, um, sorry, uh, of the young gener generation. When I, I would like to turn to Reinhard because he is a, he is a politician in our, on our panel. Um, <laughs> And not only that he's a politician, he's, the, the, he's one member of the generation which had profited highly from Europe, from the European community, from the European currency. So, Rana, did you uh, forget in your European policy making that there is probably something like a generation problem between you and them, between you and Michaelis and Marcelina? Well... If you allow me, I would l like to start first with uh, um, a short answer to the uh, Feel free to definition say you gymnastics want to say. that we've seen in the beginning. Well, I, I would like to you to respect that we can discuss statistics, but we can't discredit them as gymnastics. Look, uh, I want to discredit uh, that description of reality, but because I think that is playing down legitimate demands and that is playing down legitimate concerns. So it's already, the definition is not just a neutral thing. It's already part of a political struggle. And I believe that, um, of course, it's right to say, yes, 50% unemployment does not mean 50% of all young people are unemployed. That's true. I, I don't contest that. But of those people who would want to look for a, an opportunity on the labor market, 50% don't get it. That's what it means. And they, don't, they not only don't get a good job, they not only don't get a permanent job, they don't get an internship, they don't get a training, they get, don't get additional education. So, and what they are you are doing about left that? Out. What are you doing about this? <laughs> well, what, what I th I'm, I'm not offering a one-size-fits-all because the labor market situation in different countries is very different and the level of youth unemployment is very different. But I would offer this as a general policy, that we cannot say that this is the uh, responsibility of individual member states we have to offer a common European solution. So that's the, the first approach. Uh, not sort of, uh, not forcing the, the individual member states to take uh, control of the problem because where the problem is the most uh, acute, the ability of the governments to take, uh, uh, to, to uh, change the situation is the, the, uh, the lowest. Uh, second, I would argue that if we say it's a common problem, then we should not fall back from that analysis by offering just uh, sort of half a solution. And you alluded to the, uh, the six billion that have been put on the table. Let's calculate what that means. And then let's discuss wh wh whether it's sufficient or not. This six billion is going to be distributed between all the regions throughout Europe in all the member states where one region at least has a youth unemployment rate of 25%. There are, I believe, 18 or 19 member states in which this is the case, including Sweden. If you then calculate the number of unemployed youth and divide the six billion over seven years by that number, 
then you come up with 130 euro per capita and year. That's the level of investment that Europe has agreed upon. But do you think that it is only about money? Is it only about money I'm per not capita? saying it's only about money, but I say don't run away from the money issue uh, because there are other necessities also. And I think it's also, of course, about regulation. It's also about infrastructure. It's also about um, protection of access to uh, basic guarantees like uh, having a living or having a home and whatever. But without money, few of those promises can be delivered. And that's why I insist on the money issue. And, and I, I, if, if I look to the specifics, then it's even not the money that I have just calculated for you because uh, the member states are reluctant to allow the European uh, Union to really uh, work with a, with a budget well, that we are su supposed to distribute for th that purpose three also. Three persons on the panel would like to comment on that, so we have to turn to the intergenerational conflict later on. Marcelina, please. Uh, first of all, it's working. You just okay. have to talk and uh, talk and talk. Okay. And first, first of all, uh, I think this is the first step that the European Union is showing that uh, it is a serious problem. I don't think it's the last step European Union is going to take. I think it's the the first one, and it's it, it's a. Um, uh, I think it's very important that European Union is showing the the, the countries that uh, it 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 cares for uh, youth unemployment and uh, we're supposed to take action so i don't think you know it's it's uh, uh, it's you know that bad because uh, i think when they make a first step it's easier to make another one and the second thing i wanted to comment on uh, there are uh, instruments that are um, really good and uh, they are discussed uh, in uh, different countries in the European Union and on the uni European level as well. Uh, this is basic income and uh, sharing hours of work. Uh, for example, we don't have to work 40 hours a week. We can work 20 hours a week, still get the same money and share a work uh, because mm -hmm. uh, we, not, we, we cannot create jobs all over and um, we, 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 we just need to... Um, uh, believe that uh, we can um, work less for the same money and we can try to figure out how to do it uh, properly uh, so uh, we can um, share this, uh, well, this, let, this Let's go this into work. the details a little bit later. I, I think we have four points raised already. It is uh, basic income, it is share hours of work, it is education and it is mobility and we should just discuss that in detail later. Michalis, please. I think that everybody thinks it's also a matter of money. The question is where this money should go from my point of view because I would love to see a common European solution to a common European problem as you said but I think that there are nice schemes like the youth guarantee scheme and other proposed solutions but this could only work where there is infrastructure for that, to build upon the infrastructure. Do you think there isn't infra infrastructure in Yeah, Southern in the Europe? Mediterranean countries, there is no infrastructure to guarantee that schemes like the youth guarantee would work. Let me tell you, Greek schools are occupied many, year, many days in the year from their own students. How can you talk to these students who occupy their schools? who don't get classes from their professors about youth guarantee. To guarantee so you have to them get them back to, the, to, the, to, to, to learning before just starting You have to get like back that. to basics. Mm -hmm. When you don't have the basics, you have first to get back to basics where there is a need to get back to basics. And there, there are many countries right now in the EU where you don't have the basis to build upon. Ilaria, please. Yes, I, I will go to back to the struggle. Um, well, we are in the middle of the struggle, now, but um, please. <laughs> I would like to put some fire on it then. Um, well, I think the definition is not political. Um, and uh, what is political is the solution. But why we need, I, mean, I think it's important to look at the data and to look at the evidence because we are in times of very high budget constraint. I mean, uh, there is very little money 
uh, available to be used on policies. And so now, even uh, more than in the past, we need to have good policies. And to have good policies, we need evidence and data. Um, now, my view is that all this hype about youth unemployment um, and all this trying to do something about it is because uh, politicians want to be seen doing something. I mean, it's very popular to say, we need to do this, we need to do that. I mean, I'm not making myself popular today, and I know it. I mean, uh, I <laughs> I, I'm afraid people will start throwing stones and smartphones at me <laughs> uh, by one o'clock. Um, but I think we need to be we need to be realistic. Um, and uh, um, I think where Europe can do something, as I said, is on two issues. Uh, one is mobility, and I think we will discuss this uh, later. But I want to stress that education uh, is important, and it is important for two reasons. Um, it is in the short term, and it is even more in the long term um, because. Uh, more and more of what we produce uh, is embedded with innovation and technology and uh, uh, education is really you know the basic uh, uh, building block for, for for surviving this type uh, of market of globalized market um, now um, I want to say something else if I just a moment why not I'm the chair like I'm the chair in. and I have a, I have to ask for detail and I just what, what I just wanted to ask is what is um, education about? Is it always academic ed education or is it more and more not even non-academic education? Um, I would say that academic education, is uh, tertiary education, university education is very, very important. Uh, there is a famous um, a famous paper by, by Krugman that mentions that uh, uh, economies can be based on two growth models. One is based on perspiration, which basically means you know copy a technology that exists in another place, and uh, uh, by the time this expands in your country, you have many years of growth, and this is basically what you observe in uh, in developing uh, economies like in China and in India. Or your economy can be can be based on inspiration, and the more you become you know, rich and your GDP per capita is high, the more you need to shift from one to the other. So you need your economy to be based on inspiration. And inspiration means technology, innovation. And the, the, the building block for, for that type of economy is university education. So you need to be, um, you, need, you, you need to have people you know, thinking uh, innovations. And I don't know if you have seen it, um, but uh, uh, recently the OECD has released this new, new survey, again, data, um, called PIAC, um, as International Assessment of, uh, of Adults, basically, where they um, ask people, they, they did tests on people in many countries, uh, most European countries, um, on their ability to read, to do basic maths uh, uh, and, uh, and knowledge about science. And what you can observe there is that Europe is so diverse. Uh, so you have um, Italy really at the bottom where basic skills are lacking and this is the problem in now but um, now that we have the chance to do something about because there is attention to the labor market we need to, do, to talk about this Reinhard please trying to be specific um, I think the crisis uh, um, as it hits young people is also uh, laying bare some of the structural problems that uh, haven't been dealt with in uh, many countries giving you an example uh, from, uh, concerning Spain. Uh, the uh, labor market administration is just abysmally bad. Uh, if you're unemployed, you may have maybe one interview and that's it. And there is no one who would really be at hand to offer you all the different options that might even be out there if someone knew how to look for it. So uh, I think the uh, infrastructure is one uh, issue that holds people back even uh, uh, if, uh, even uh, more so than, than might be necessary. Second specific argument, when you're asking for education, I would like to emphasize uh, vocational training. Uh, in, in this crisis, uh, we can compare uh, the experience of different member states uh, as it affects the transition from the learning phase or the, the schooling phase to the labor market. And there you can evaluate that those European examples that have given more emphasis to a dual vocational training system, like in Switzerland and Austria and Denmark and Netherlands and Germany, are more successful in giving young people an opportunity to really gain a foothold in the labor market. So, so you think I that think the that would be a, 
an important change that could be implemented. And indeed, in Spain, some regions are doing that. Some, even some companies are doing that. The government is trying to move slowly in that direction. So I'm not saying all the solutions have to be pan-European solutions, but there has to be pan-European money to finance locally adequate solutions. Michalis, please. Yes, uh, just uh, Michalis first and then you, please. I totally agree on that. And uh, this is the, the, the reason why schemes like Youth Guarantee are successful and will be really successful in Nordic countries, in Central European countries and so on, because exactly the infrastructure exists. Ilaria, please. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I thought he was nasty to me, but he's not. Uh, <laughs> no, I have one quick comment about vocational training. I'm stealing your statistics, but not your water. <laughs> Um, no, one quick comment on vocational training, because again, now all this attention about youth unemployment, last year the topic of the year was vocational training. Um, I think it's a great system, the one that you have in Germany, uh, but I think this is not a system that needs to be exported to all countries. I think it really depends uh, on, the, on what your country is producing. So I think vocational training is great if 20% uh, of your economy is uh, based on, manuf on the manufacturing sector, which in Europe is only Germany and Italy, basically. Um, well, uh, the share of, uh, of employment, uh, the share of employment in the manufacturing sector is on average in Europe around 12%. And it's higher than that, uh, much higher, meaning 20% uh, only in Germany and Italy. I'm quite sure about this few because I look at them recently. <laughs> um, Anyway, what I want to say is that um, if, you're, if your economy is, is uh, if, if manufacturing sector is important in your economy, then vocational training is great. But uh, um, in, in the long term, where this will be less and less because the, train, the, the, the trend is declining uh, on employment in this sector, um, you, need, you, ne you need to have the general education uh, uh, to complement for that because the general education is much, much more, is much more flexible. Um, and flexibility in a service economy matters. Reinhard. Please, and Michalism. Well, this is an important point, I believe, because it ties in our discussion with the overall, the more general development model that we might be looking for. Um, I, I can test the numbers. Um, in Europe, on average, the manufacturing uh, share of GDP is 15.1% presently. There are six countries where it's above 20 but there are countries like the UK and France where it's hovering about 10. Now, the <coughs> goal that has been pronounced politically in the environment of the present crisis has been to emphasize manufacturing as a necessary component of a sound economic development. So I not only contest the numbers, I also contest the strategy that says Let's build a sort of science-based or knowledge-based uh, economy, ignoring the uh, very basic contribution that manuf a strong manufacturing sector uh, would provide to any mm -hmm. economy. If you look at the different economies, how they fare in this crisis, you will see that Wait those economies that have a strong manufacturing base are doing much better. And in, in, in the strategic perspective, I think you will not be able to hold on to the knowledge development and the research aspects of any industrial sector unless you manage to hold on to the manufacturing also. Ilaria, please. Uh, and, and I would like you to comment that on and in the perspective of our issue on the panel, and that is solidarity, please. Okay, uh, that's a big jump. Uh, let you me will manage it. Uh, for once, I would like to say that I agree with Reinhardt <laughs> uh, in, in this sense. Um, I think um, the manufacturing sector is important. Now, the issue is that in terms of, uh, of employment, the share of employment, uh, the share of people it occupies, there is a trend, uh, there is a decreasing trend. So it may matter from the point of view of the economy, but in terms of employment, less and less people have been working historically in the, in the manufacturing sector. And this will not stop. I mean, technology will always replace uh, work that is a uh, routine type of work. Uh, now, what is uh, also to be taken into account is that 
the, 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 the border between, uh, um, between manufacturing and service is blurring. Uh, meaning that what is counted as manufacturing is more, as more, is more and more, for example, research and development. So the engineers rather than, so than the, than the worker. What has Europe to do with the unemployed young people to meet your thinking about how the development will go on? Education again. Marcelina, do you agree? Um, not exactly. Um, first of all, I want to say this is what uh, <laughs> we both agree on, that uh, definition is political, it's always political. Um, everything is politics, so... Um, uh, yeah, but uh, back to the point. Um, I believe that um, it's not technology that is uh, pushing away young people from manufacturers, is that uh, um, we are transferring our um, factories to the countries where we can pay people less. Uh, we don't have to um, think about uh, trade unions. We don't have to think about their, secu their security. And this is the reason why uh, we don't have um, manufacturers in, in Europe. Because we, we're still using these things, but they are not, produ produ they are not produced in European Union. They are produced in Bangladesh, in China, because uh, it's cheaper that way. So and we would you agree all with agree. Uh, would you agree with Reinhardt that there has to be something like a remanufacturing Euro program? Yes, I agree. I really do. Because uh, when we had this economic crisis, um, the countries who had um, um, not... Uh, who had, um, economic based on um, um, banks and, and, and uh, financial system, they did far worse than the countries who, who had uh, manufacturers. And uh, this is the reason why we're supposed to um, uh, like re-manufacturing Europe. Well, I'm, I'm very glad that we don't have to uh, discuss climate change on this <laughs> panel because we have would run in deep, in, in deep <laughs> water can, with that. We <laughs> Michael, please. That, that would tie in perfectly because we're, of course, not asking <coughs> for the old type of energy. Yeah, exactly. We, we all write high-fricks. We, we all, yeah, all right. jobs. <laughs> we need green, green jobs, but we can, uh, you know, create manufacturers that are green. Michalis, so please. The thing is that we need jobs, uh, most of all. Of course, we need remanufacturing of Europe, and Europe must produce in the end, something. Because Europe keeps not producing things, and China is way getting ahead of us, Brazil. There are so many superpowers in the wider neighborhood, and Europe is staying behind. And of course, this has a big, big effect on uh, young people. But I think that we keep discussing on solutions to a problem to the problem of youth unemployment. So there is so a problem discuss, of youth unemployment. Let's, let's discuss mobility, please. Let's discuss the question uh, Theresa brought up in the, in the, in the, in the, in the first panel. Uh, what could Europe, should Europe do something about mobility of making young people move to countries where the job market is quite good? Should uh, Greek, Greek uh, should the young students of Greek uh, of Greece move to Germany? Should Spanish uh, people move to Austria? What should Even they do? Even more, we have the copyright in mobility. I think, and the, the, we don't speak anymore for about mobility. We speak about brain drain, the mobility of Greek, uh, young Greeks from Greece to other European countries or to the US is so big that people in, back in Greece are now talking about the fear of brain drain, that people not only leave the country to find a better job or to get better qualifications and get more education, but they have, they're afraid of that they, would, these would people you, would, you, would not come back. Would you suggest to hinder them to just leave the country? You cannot, of course, hinder them, but you should motivate them in every possible way by offering the best possible education and employment to stay and build a better future. Because if we talk about generations and the generation gap, if they don't stay to fight for a better future in their own country, then there are countries that won't have a good future, while other countries would be having a better and better future. And the gap will be growing. Reinhard, Ilaria, and Marcelina, please. I would challenge the brain drain paradigm. Uh, I don't think it has to be that way. And my example is Indians in Silicon Valley. 
There are about 100,000 Indian expats living, studying, and uh, doing, uh, doing innovative work in Silicon Valley. <coughs> there has been a study uh, analyzing how many of them have become entrepreneurs, quite a few, and where they have created the jobs, and that's interesting. Most of them have created the jobs back home in India. Why is that? Because there has been a very uh, interesting mechanism of sort of not losing those people, not, not <coughs> abandoning them, not believing that once they move to the Silicon Valley, they're lost brains, but staying in touch and organizing an exchange and giving them opportunities <coughs> to create jobs back home and uh, to, to uh, organize cooperations with major Indian players and so on. And I think we could do something on similar lines. There are so many like well-educated well Greek IT engineers. Some come to Germany, for instance, but they could well be tied in to the development of IT clusters in certain regions of Greece without living necessarily in Athens or some other I would, place, I would, even from here. I would very much like to make y both of you comment on that because I think ev especially Poland has made similar experiences, not with, uh, with the Silicon Valley, but with the uh, uh, people from Poland who worked in Great Britain and in Ireland the last 10 years, went back in the crisis and made, and made a, a, um, the, the, the Polish economy quite good going through the crisis. So first Michalis, then Marcelina, please. The only thing I would like to add is that I really like the idea you just mentioned, but I think you cannot compare India to Greece because the Greeks are just too many. Greece is 11 million people. India are billions of people. If 100,000 of them go to the Silicon Valley, it's not a big deal. If 100,000 Greeks go abroad, that's a huge deal for the country, for a small Mediterranean country with an aging population. Marcelina, please. Um, I was the one who came from UK because and of you the are crisis. Back, you are back now. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I came back to Poland because of the crisis. Um, but I don't think that uh, me and the people who are like me are the reason why Pol Poland did uh, quite good uh, through the crisis. Um, but we still have problems uh, of uh, immigration, uh, like EU, in, in, in EU immigration, uh, because now uh, we are getting to um, our um, highest point uh, of people who are abroad in UK, for example, and um, it's uh, about two millions at the moment. So uh, I think that um, it's... Uh, Mobility is, is great because uh, when we have open borders and we can work everywhere, we, can, we don't need to ask for a work permission, we don't have to ask for visas. It's nice because uh, if, you, if you, for example, don't feel good in your country, you want to do something in, 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 and you, can, you, you know you can do, you create something in a different country or you can get exper experience and get back, that's fine. But we still have to focus on... Um, uh, security uh, on security uh, of the people who are living in their countries because uh, migration not supposed to be uh, it's supposed to be a choice not uh, not not something you have to do because you cannot find a job and you have to pay your bills so um, in Poland, it's uh, unfortunately the second option because um, um, many of my friends to migrated to to different kind different countries, and uh, it's uh, our our um, prime minister said that uh, our unemployment is falling. Well, we have two million people abroad. Well, guess guess why it's falling? <laughs> Hilaria, please. Thank you, thank you, Ursula. I think mobility is an interesting topic uh, to discuss because I think it takes out of people their, let's say, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde uh, uh, perspective. Because you have people saying, the same person saying, oh, we need more mobility in the EU, we should be a single market, and then five minutes later, oh yes, but we have a brain drain problem um, if we do that. Um, I, I, think, I think at least uh, within the EU, the, the the issue should not be put in, term, in terms of brain drain um, for two reasons. 
The first reason is that um, there is a cyclical component to, to, to mobility. Um, I don't know if you remember this fantastic cover page from, from The Economist, I think it was something like 2004, 2005, <laughs> uh, which pointed at Germany as the sick man of Europe. Uh, so, I mean, less than 10 years ago, Germany was the problem. Unemployment was 12%, um, and I could very well imagine um, <coughs> architects from Germany going to Spain, where there was a big construction boom, to work there. Um, now we're facing the opposite situation uh, and uh, we are afraid of a brain drain. I mean, why is that? As long as there is circulation within the EU, as long as, as, as there are asymmetric shock uh, in this continent, and we have people going from one place to the other, then uh, it's a much better allocation of resources, rather than having people staying in their own country just to be unemployed and, and forget what they studied or forget their skills as engineers and, and then become and unemployed think, even later. And I think uh, the second question to that is whether only migration and mobility creates something like a European generation, just making experiences in, in, other, in different countries of Europe and just finding yourself as part being part of Europe and of a generation Europe. Michalis, Marcelina, Reinhardt, please. And after, after the, that, we would very much like to invite you to join our discussion and just make your contributions. Of course, the current European crisis, especially in the Mediterranean countries, shows that it's a matter of allocation of resources, a better allocation of resources. If people leave a country to go to another one and there is no good future for the country, there is not a big deal because it's a European community after all. That's a big, big joke, I think. Because <laughs> what we were saying in the first panel before, it's the European project, but of course the national states have their own problems. And in the end of the day, I don't think that Europe is going to really care about the national problems. It's all about the debt, the public debt. It's a market issue in the end of the day. So it's not the allocation of resources, but it's the reality. And you the reality a, is very, very of, different. It's a question of pressure and austerity then. Yes, of course. And the, 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 the reality is very, very different in every member state. Marcelina, please. Uh, yeah, I think this is the reason why we're supposed to um, start talking about uh, um, European social policy. Um, because we don't have, <laughs> like, in a, in a, um, we have a little bit of so, so European social policy, but it's not enough, and we need to... Um, try to do um, to create more or less the same situation in all the all the countries uh, more or less the same system but there's a one thing i want to say i hate when people say uh, about other people resources we are not resources okay we have families we have thank you we have families we have friends we want to live in different countries different cities we can choose the cities and the market c can cannot tell us where we're supposed to go. We want to go where we want to go, and okay? And I really, I really hate that. And the, uh, the, the second thing, uh, I hate when people telling me I'm supposed to be flexible. I don't want to be flexible, okay? Uh, I want to have a job. I want to be, uh, I want to have a stable job. I want to have a stable life. I want to start a family. So, so, let, Basina, so let, me, let me ask the question, who is who has a duty to provide these things to you? Is that Europe? Is that Poland? Is that part yourself? And if you think it is a duty of your country or of Europe, who should pay for that? Okay, we are paying the taxes. We are uh, we are giving something to the community, so we can ask community to give us something back. Uh, and we uh, supposed to, you know. Uh, there are things like taxes, and uh, if you are rich, you're supposed to pay p m m more taxes than the poor, because uh, if you have like 50 euros and you pay 50% of that, you have only 25 for living, and if, if you have 5,000 and you pay 50%, uh, you still have two and a half uh, thousand euros. So, uh, you still can manage. So you think that it is enough money, it is not on, uh, it's only not in the right hands? Uh, there is enough money. We're supposed to, for example, there is a Tobin tax, uh, so that's a good one. Uh, uh, and uh, we're supposed to, um, I don't know how you say it, uh, how to say it in English, but it's a um, uh, currency transaction. Um, Financial trans uh, yeah. uh, transaction uh, yeah. uh, tax. But so uh, that we have a lot of possibilities to get uh, 
enough money to make all of us uh, living in uh, very good conditions, but we don't want to because we are afraid that, I don't know, they're going to run away. Where are they going to run away? Reinhard, uh, please. Um, as a politician, I think that the European politicians um, didn't agree fully on the taxation question. They yeah, but some countries did. So, Reinhard, please. Well, regarding the Tobin tax, uh, I think it was 10 member states that uh, had some preliminary agreement, which is now basically falling apart because they're all being he uh, lobbied very heavily by the financial sector. And I'm not sure we will see the introduction of the Tobin tax uh, over the yeah, next two or three years. If we, if we, if we had been solid, uh, sol uh, solidary, um, if we were working together, like whole European Union, that would work. But you sure. have to find that's, majorities that's for that. That's begging the question, basically, because how can we create a situation in which this level of cooperation that you're asking for would indeed materialize, because it's obviously not happening. And I think it's not only uh, the, the responsibility of some misguided politicians. There is a broader problem there. And I think that resonates also in the context of what has been called social Europe or common social responsibility. It's not a popular uh, idea that there should be a common social security system throughout Europe. If you go and ask the trade unions, if you go and ask the voters, they prefer the system they know nationally to the introduction of a possible pan-European system. That's been the problem in the very minute when the common market was introduced and uh, President Delors offered the trade unions also a social Europe and they rejected that. And it's still not popular to go for a common social security system. So that's really tricky. Therefore, I would argue that this cannot we should go in that direction and there have to be some common minimum, minimum standards and so on and we can do more with regard to youth unemployment or child poverty and so on but the, the basic approach that we have to pursue presently is not on the social side but on the industrial, on the economic side. I believe if we can't come up with a new policy that promotes what could be called sustainable growth throughout Europe, including the southern countries, there's no solution to any of these social problems. And I believe it's bad if we just confine our discussion in the, in the narrow alternative of either staying unemployed or emigrating. You could, of course, come up with ideas of uh, promoting social entrepreneurship and giving people an opportunity where they have been living that hasn't existed before. And I think in the context of a, uh, an, a sustainable growth strategy, that could be defined. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, can I, can I, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm very sorry, but I, I, I would very much like to have the audience now be part of our discussion. You are the first to react on that, okay? okay. And uh, the lady with the blue jacket, please. And halt, stop, und zurück. Hi, uh, my name is Ivana Jordanovska. I come from uh, Jeff Macedonia. Um, what I wanted to comment is um, something that goes along the lines of our ideology, and that is, I very much liked what was said just now about the um, economic uh, integration that is needed in the EU, because one of the basic theories of integration, neo-functionalism, suggests that if you start integration in one field, then th that will just go on. So if we start with economic integration, and if we actually integrate the union even more, wouldn't you say that there's no more brain drain? Because then we wouldn't be thinking in terms of, oh, this person left Greece to go to Denmark. We think in terms of this person moved in the European Union, which is in my opinion, the final goal of the European Union. Thank you very much, Ivana. I, I uh, would like to collect to the, the lady on the right side, or on, on the left side from you, thing. And, and um, then the two persons in the last line. 
Hey, my name is Victoria. I work at the Chilean Embassy here in Berlin. Um, I'd like to say something to Illyria without trying to offend you. I'm just really outraged how someone that calls him or herself an expert can feel that there's no, or can be so blind on the problem of youth unemployment and only suggest education and mobility as the solution to it. Um, there's so many educated people that really pass their degrees of honors, especially in the South, but not only, and that are having a hard time to find a job. Even for me, um, I passed my bachelor's here in Germany, and it's just like the employees, they always expect your practical experience, and I feel like the state that only offers theoretical education, that's not enough. You don't, you're lacking the experience and you can only get it through internships that even here in Germany, they're not paid a lot of the times. And then you expect people to be independent, to move out of their homes. But how can they do that if they don't have the money? Victoria, I, I think we have your point. Thank you very much. And that, now the last line, uh, there were two persons and then we go back to the panel. And Jen, could I turn back to you? The last, the last. I would, I'm Simon here from Berlin as well. I would like to add to the first question and ask Ilaria. Um, you you um, said to not um, put the, the, uh, the issue of labor migration in terms of rain, rain, but resource allocation. But isn't there the remaining problem that we still have national public budgets? So if we see um, labor migration in terms of um, resource allocation, shouldn't we have then a real European economy, which includes European budget, European taxes as well, because then it doesn't matter where industry is based, where taxes are paid? If you just can stand up when you make your remarks, everybody can see you and recognize who you are. So um, that is a um, new, new condition in, in, in persons who want to be part of the discussion. Please. Hi. Thank you. I'm um, Ines from Spain. Uh, I have uh, some comments and a question. Um, well, I agree that the unemployment rates are not exact, uh, but I think they are higher, not lower. Uh, because and, and well, that's people a challenge yeah. for Laria. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, and they're not; um, they don't include students. I mean, students are not included in the unemployment rates. Uh, the unemployment rates about, are about people that are looking for a job, and students are not looking for a job. Uh, about your idea of more education, uh, how do you g how do we get more education in southern countries when education is getting more and more and more expensive, and um, and well, um, there has to be a limit to education. We can get um, five master's degrees, and all, uh, not not only um, because of edu uh, because of. Well, I, I think we have the point. Yeah, yeah, no, Do, yeah. There is no sense in just going on studying just yeah, yeah. But not only, only to because make us uh, going on, st on studying because we, we can't live um, from our power, uh, from our parents uh, yeah. all of our lives. I mean, there's only 20 percent of, uh, of young people under 30 uh, not depending on their uh, on their parents in Spain. So yes, I think just yeah. Ilaria just okay, so wants to react on that. Okay, Ilaria. Yeah, uh, Marcelina, sorry. I, I promised you just... Oh, it's okay? Okay, Ilaria. Okay, I feel in the limelight. <laughs> um, uh, I agree on circulation, uh, the, 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 the very first question. I think the, the, the perspective towards mobility should be really circulation and not brain drain. So people going uh, from one country to the other, then people from that country going to the, to, to, to the south, north or south, south or north, or the same people moving across their lives. Um, and I think there it's where people, where everyone gains. I mean, the state of departure, the state of arrival, the person, the everyone, uh, the public finances even. Um, on the question of uh, public uh, national budgets, uh, I mean, I think eventually we will go there. It's a matter of uh, how long will it take. It seems it's taking long. I think that the the, the monetary union without uh, the, the fiscal union it's uh, it's a very strange animal, and we've seen how difficult it is to manage. Um, so at one point there will be, I think, European taxes uh, and European pol finance policies through the, the, those taxes, but. It's a matter of how long it takes and where we start. Um, I think there is a, under discussion right now, a little starting point, may not be too much, but I think it's a, uh, it's a Trojan horse towards uh, national budget. 
uh, and, uh, and, 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 and Victoria and Ines are just made up the point, and I think that is very crucial, that most of the people we are talking about are very well educated. They just attended universities and academies. They have made their degrees. Uh, what do you, would you tell them? They don't have an education problem, haven't they? Uh, well, when I say more education, I don't mean that people, well, some people can stay longer uh, in education, but it doesn't make sense, I agree, to have five master's degree, I mean, what is the added value of that? So I totally agree on that. Um, what would you suggest them? Uh, I would say two, I mean, more, more education means two things. Um, one is to have more people going into education, um, and the other one is to have uh, um, better education, actually. Um, as I said, I this survey that was recently released on the, the ability of people to read and do simple math shows that even young people that leave education might have a problem. I mean, but let's stick with the people Victoria and Ines meant when they said we are well educated. They don't have problems in reading and and in math. And math. <laughs> <laughs> then I would say, math. just sorry. <laughs> Okay, we can continue that. But, um, well, I would say mobility is an option. I mean, this is actually an option that people didn't have 50 years ago, when mobility meant uh, people working in the coal mines. I mean, we have European rights, European citizens, citizenship rights. Let's just use them. And what, what is wrong with it? I think it's a, it's a learning opportunity and not, and not, uh, and not a problem. And on top, of this, on top of this, when you have uh, a, a severe recession in your country and there are no jobs, there are no vacancies, what can you do? What is the point of just waiting? For the, for the next, uh, to be in the queue for the next job. Marcelina, Michalis, Reinhardt, please. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> migration is not an option for many people in Europe. It's a necessity because uh, they cannot get a job and uh, they are, uh, as you said, they are well educated and we cannot have like 10 degrees. Um, uh, uh, we, we just, you know, uh, we Want, what we want, what I think we want, like youth in Europe, we want to have security, we want to uh, treat mi migration as an option. If I want to go, I can go. If I don't want to go, I don't, I, I don't have to. And uh, I like the idea of the uh, circulation, uh, but it has to be like voluntarily. I, I, I can go to, for example, Denmark, and then I can go to Spain. If I want to, I can get uh, experience from there. Uh, I, I can meet people, I can, uh, you know, um, expand my, my circle of friends and, and people who I know who I can count on and who, who, who can provide me in some information and things like this. But it has to be an option. It has to be something that I can choose, not I, some, something I have to do. And... Um, the uh, the other thing I wanted to say before it was um, that the, the 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 idea of uh, of, of uh, taxing and uh, idea um, of uh, basic income that uh, it's not quite popular it's uh, it's not popular because we are not explaining it uh, because if we if we properly explain people something. I th and we we started discussion. Uh, I think uh, many people should uh, would agree with us. Uh, if we are not, uh, this is something that politicians uh, unfortu unfortunately do. Uh, they are not explaining. They are not discussing. They are not talking to people. I don't. F I don't. Um, I found out that there is um, there is a, a European initia 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 initiative initiative. initiative. Um, for um, uh, for uh, basic income, uh, because my um, uh, uh, professor from university sent it to me. Uh, not even one politician in Poland told me that uh, there is something like this. Not even one Euro, uh, Euro, Euro, uh, anyone who is in, uh, in European Parliament. No one told me about that. I found out on myself it's because because, because I'm I'm studying social policy, and. Um, if no one knows that there is an uh, initiative like this and no one is explaining people, I know what it is because, because it's my field of interest, but many people don't know. If we explain them, maybe they will be able to agree and to force their governments to, uh, uh, to, to but, create... But they would be even 
able to not agree. And we had a very yeah, broad yeah, discussion but, but on that it, in Germany. And there, I think most people didn't agree to that. But uh, Reinhard, you had, uh, the Greens in Germany had it especially. If you could make a sh very short comment on that, and then we could turn to Michaelis and to you again to just answer the questions of the audience. Well, indeed, there has been a broad discussion, uh, you could say, with proposals coming from all political corners, from the liberals, the left, uh, some industrialists, and so on. And uh, I think it's a vastly overvalued idea. And I would tend to say, if someone has explained the basic income to you and you think you've understood it, they haven't explained it right. <laughs> Michaelis, please. And if you probably could comment even on Marcelina's um, point that she said, uh, you have to, to go voluntarily and you have to have the chance to stay in your home country if you want to. And if you just um, think that even the best national state and even Europe couldn't provide everybody of you and of us a situation where we can choose voluntarily in every phase of our life cycle, if you could comment on both of that, I would be very grateful. Uh, mobility is a wonderful idea. I totally support that. And it would be an option in the European Union today if the EU cohesion policy was working. The EU cohesion policy worked really well and then the crisis came. And we forgot about cohesion and we started working with market terms and we started working uh, uh, on debt and austerity policies and everything. Do you, and think, do, do you think it worked very well if you look at, especially at Greece, the, the gap, and if you look at the cohesion policy, you have sometimes the impression that there has been, things have, have been allocated badly. Things have been allocated badly, but the gap still closed a bit among Europe. So the cohesion policy worked quite well. It could work much better, of course, but now it's not working. Now the EU shows that it wants to relaunch the cohesion policy and the structural funds, for example, as part of the multi-annual financial framework, the new EU budget, is a good initiative. But there is a big prerequisite to, get, to use these structural funds to invest, in other uh, words, in your own country. You have to co-finance. And some countries, especially the ones in crisis right now, cannot serve this co-financing prerequisite. Uh, this is the money which was, has been taken for the European Youth Programme, hasn't it? Why not? Look, I think this criticism is not just. Uh, the cohesion policy has been... <laughs> has been changed in a way to make it, to adapt it to the Greek situation, for instance. If there is any prerequisite for obtaining cohesion money, it's 5% co-financing financing at the most. I mean, you can't say this is a, an unrealistic uh, uh, condition. Uh, uh, my criticism of the cohesion policy would be different. We have invested, and not only in, in some countries, but in many countries, we have invested in some kind of infrastructure that is not necessarily delivering a productive use that helps creating jobs. I think the new cohesion or structural fund policy should focus much more on financing Progressive clusters, uh, transnational also, transborder also. And, and this has not been at the core of the policy. So I think what we should discuss much more is again, and, and I'm preaching this gospel and you, you recognize it, uh, it, we have to discuss the kind of economic model we pursue. Give, let me give an, another example from Spain. There is m coal mining still underway in Asturias very famous, very progressive tradition. But every single job in that coal mining industry is subsidized with roughly a million euro per year. Every single job. And it's not a very productive industry. And it's not a future-oriented industry. We have to change the development model. And that money could be used, could be, could be put to much better use in progressive technologies. And could you perhaps answer Simon's question about the sense of our discussion for the background of national public budgets, of um, just 
being coming not together in Europe with uh, something like a financing Europe as not not only from the national budgets. The the national budgets are what they are, and there's no use in 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 uh, sort of promoting the the ideal that somehow we could substitute European solutions for every national problem. But what Europe should focus on would be infrastructure investment in, in the right kind of infrastructure, broadband infrastructure, uh, um, to, to, to uh, uh, enhance the, the public grid, the electricity grid, the, the rail grid, and so on. That could well support um, productive investment, uh, research infrastructure. Uh, if you if you go to some of the uh, the the most successful clusters, all of them are built about around research institutions that have a very close relationship to SME, for instance, and to to productive investment. So that is something where the EU can make a difference. Do you have some? Questions and remarks. Well, we can take, I think we can, if we, we are realistic and you want to have lunch in about f uh, 15 minutes, we can take five questions. I would like to turn to the last arm I can see on the, on, on the right side. Yes, please. And then we uh, have uh, the front, front lines had, haven't been represented uh, rightly. So we take the lady on the third line and the guy on the third line on, on that side and, and you and the uh, we have something now we have to have to do something like a quota. There is an elder, elderly guy uh, with a white paper. He is he will be part two and that I'm very sorry but we have to, to leave it there. So just start please. Good morning. Good afternoon. I'm from from Spain. And I wanted to say that mobility is an option when there's an alternative, because this is optional. So, for example, my ex-flatmate, he is a lawyer, he has two masters, and he tried to find a job in Spain, every job, barman, cleaner, everything. And he didn't find anything, and he has to move to London because he has a, a job as a barman there, but he didn't want to move. So he's sad now because he preferred to live in space. So mobility is an option when it's optional. This is the first thing. And then the second thing is that um, Germany, for example, gives a lot of money to Spain, but he, it, sorry, because the country, <laughs> it uh, doesn't give the money to the Spanish people because the citizens of Germany give the money to the government and the government gives the money to the rich people in Spain. So in Germany, people is more poor and the rich people in Spain is more rich because the facts are not countries, are <laughs> social statements. So then this is my comment. Thank you very much. So then we have the, uh, the two third line people. Okay, we start with you, please. Thank you very much. My name is Klaus Peter Baumann. I'm coming from Berlin, and I've traveled, worked in very different countries, and it was always a pleasure to me, Mr. But Bidikop. you did it voluntarily. Yeah, Mr. Wittekopper. You did, did it. I uh, get no, it? we have we have to make it clear. You did, did it voluntarily. You were not first forced to. Um, to mobility, you no. I've your been choice. in China and was okay. invited mm. to give lectures in Russia, okay. in the on the in the birthplace or at the university in the birthplace of uh, Lenin. Why not? So Several the question times. to Rainer, please, Mr. Butikova, did I get it right? You, we, the EU is subsidizing each workplace of these coal mining workers. You have just mentioned with one million euros a year. No, what? Spain is. Spain, Not the Spain EU. Is Spain is doing that. E as, Spain, as okay, but Germany uh, where are they getting the money ago. from? Uh, at last, uh, they are getting the money from Europe, aren't they? Thank so you. why are not sending these coal mining workers home with 50,000 euros a year, <laughs> and then you do have 950,000 for better education, for younger people, for better 
living conditions for the older ones, like me, perhaps. I'm going. Thank, thank you very much, I'm Professor. I, I think we've got your, po your this point. This is not uh, well placed money, in my opinion. Thank you very much. And now we have the two so third line persons on the right. Uh, yes, the lady there. My name is Lotta, I'm from Germany, and I have to say, it was an interesting discussion, but I'm a bit surprised, really, what you've been talking about the last hour, because the topic was solidarity. <laughs> and I'd been looking forward to hearing something about solidarity or the lack of it, really, in the European Union or in an intergenerational situation. And I mean, it's all very well talking about mobility, flexibility, personal examples, but I've really been missing kind of getting to the point or really talking about solidarity. I think Michael just kind of scraped it a bit, maybe someone else did, but I've been missing getting to this point and talking Thank about you, this topic. Thank you, we try Thanks. to do that. And the third line, and I think they're... Uh, I'm Leo from Germany and Italy, and uh, I wanted, I mean, I agree that it is more sensible to have uh, mobility rather than just uh, staying where you are and expecting somebody to give you a job. Um, but this is under given constraints. So I, my specific question to Ilaria is uh, whether you would think it is preferable to have um, outside investment in Greece and uh, where the uh, cost of credit is prohibitively high and given the austerity and uh, no no good outlook for the recession to end anytime soon and if it does rebound then from a very low level uh, was it wouldn't be uh, more preferable if it were possible to have um, outside investment in Greece rather than mobility out stemming from Greece and I think this actually connects to your uh, mention of the Trojan horse because solidarity would probably be more easily achieved if we had uh, more European controls on budgets and so on. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. And now uh, just uh, take, take, I take the lady uh, and then we just have to come, to come back to the panel, please. Thank you, I appreciate the exception. Hi, my name is Elizabeth, I come from Greece. I studied at Harvard University on a Fulbright scholarship and currently I live in Brussels. Uh, Mr. Butikoffer, please, um, I'd like your comment on the fact that uh, you mentioned a really interesting example of how Indians working on Silicon Valley, they were able to go back in India and set up their entrepreneurships there. And uh, I'd like to ask you, um, how can Greece, with specifically measures, reclaim its drain brains and do you think uh, this is possible? If not, I, um, I urge you to hire me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, Marcelina, would you like to start to answer our, f our, our last remarks from the audience and with a special emphasis on Lotta's um, yeah. remark that we should turn to solidarity uh, I think we are, uh, even if we are not um, calling it solidarity, we are talking about it. Uh, because if you, um, if you, if you um, um, uh, give people, um, if you, if you uh, f fulfill the basic needs, uh, they will be, uh, it is, first of all, it is solidarity. Because we all uh, agreeing that if we all give something to the community, we're supposed to give, b get back something from community, but um, not uh, all equal share, but the share we actually need. So uh, if uh, we are rich, we are getting less, and if we are poor, we are getting more. And um, more control uh, over the bu uh, over the bad budget budgeters, and more control over uh, of the U European Union over the, the the national countries, is uh, something that I I could call like solidarity because um, we uh, we and we are in a way s s uh, we are. Uh, uh, using this solidarity at the moment, because, for example, Poland is is, is using money b b to uh, to um, uh, m more fast um, fast uh, to to have a faster growth uh, and to 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 
um, to um, uh, build roads and build buildings. Invest and, in and infrastructure. Yeah, invest in infrastructure, exactly. But uh, what we haven't said is, uh, is one thing. Uh, we need to, uh, on the national level and in the EU, EU level, we need to uh, fight uh, with... Um, with Gini efficiency, because uh, it's something, it's, in, it, it, it's, a, um, it's a efficiency that uh, is telling us uh, how uh, much inequality is in a, in a, in a country, uh, because it's a, it's a difference between the, the highest, uh, the highest uh, uh, earnings and the lowest earnings. And uh, we can uh, say so that, that... that measures... Equality, in yeah, in inequality, in inequality, inequality, and um, this is something uh, we we forgot when when we were discussing uh, what we supposed to do uh, if we supposed to invest in social uh, European social policy or uh, we sh supposed to invest in in a in a um, economic uh, mm -hmm. we 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 can invest in economic and in growth. Uh, but we need to remember to always uh, have in mind Gini efficiency because, for example, in Poland there is a growth, but uh, the Gini effic efficiency is rising. So, so, the, so uh, the, the rich people the are getting more rich and the, and the poor people are getting more poorer. But and so, so uh, there is no uh, reason why we... W I think we, we, we need to find different way to describe growth uh, and we um, we what? talking about this. We are talking about solidarity. Uh -huh. It's 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 just we are not calling it. It's just one of the things you, that, that is solidarity. One of the things. Michalis, there. please, could you just uh, take your clothing remarks and uh, take Lotus um, Lotus point and probably even Elizabeth's point, just with the question of wouldn't it be more sensible to invest in the southern countries than to make people just move or to, 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 to leave the country? I think uh, I totally agree that solidarity is a very nice notion, is a very good idea, but it's uh, about policies. And we're talking about the different policies and the approaches you want to have to reach solidarity and to sow your solidarity among the European Union. So I think we're talking about solidarity, even if we don't use this nice word that was one of the basic uh, European notions. But uh, in the end of the day, I think, because mobility is also a nice idea for you and one of the basic remarks in the discussion, I think we should all try to make it an option. Because mobility, right now, is not an option in the EU for most of the Mediterranean countries. And this is the not solidary per face of Europe right now. Ilaria, would mobility become an option, be voluntary, really vol voluntarily, if um, we had some investment schemes for the southern European countries to just go turn to direct investment and not to the uh, just moving the labor force from point to point? Would that be sensible? Um, I don't know, <laughs> but I don't think that. I don't think there is an altern I don't think these are alternatives. I mean, you can have productive investments, and I think whether public or private investments need to be productive, otherwise it's a waste of money. Uh, but you can also have, uh, have mobility, which uh, at the end of the day have a positive uh, uh, return as long as it is in this framework of circulation, um, which is something that was not possible 50 years ago, and it is actually a possibility now. So I think the EU, which has this cross-country perspective should, should, uh, should do something on this uh, because that's the right level to do, to do things. Uh, I, I want to make, I, mean, I, I would love to answer all the, que the questions and I'm grateful for that. Maybe we can continue over lunch. But I would running just, out of time yes, exactly. a little bit. I would just like to make one point on this, uh, on this question from uh, here. Sorry, from I don't Lota. remember your name. Uh, which is a great point. I mean, I, I totally agree. This was about solidarity and we never mentioned it. Uh, but I wonder, are we ready for that? Uh, because... In, in the current system, uh, solidarity means redistribution of money from one country to the other, basically, which means that my Belgian taxes go to finance something, I don't know, in Italy, of which I have no control because I'm not voting for, for, for policymakers. I, I don't know how money is, uh, is going to be spent. So are we ready for this? Because already with the, with the crisis and when there was the, the issue of the, of the potential default of Greece, uh, and there was no redistribution because there was a loan from the other countries, not, so not even a gift. Uh, already there was a gigantic case and people were opposing that. So are we ready for that? I leave the, the question open. I, I, I hope we are, but I'm not sure. Reinhard, could you just 
take your closing remarks and even to um, answer Klaus Peter's um, remarks that uh, Europe or national states are wasting money in old industries. That is not only the case in Spain, it has been the case in Germany, it has been the case well, in France and Italy, everywhere, all over Europe. I just wanted to clarify, I men men mentioned this example from Spain not to support it, but in order to denounce it. Uh, but uh, uh, Ursula is right. Uh, you could add a long list of other examples. The G20 in 2009 agreed that they would phase out uh, fossil subsidies uh, progressively. Nothing has happened. The fossil subsidies that are being paid out today are twice the amount it was when they took that decision. You, uh, globally. So there's a huge task, and I think that could finance a lot of economic alternatives. So second, uh, I was asked about Greece, and uh, could Greece do uh, a similar stunt like the Indians do in, in, in Silicon Valley? I'm sure uh, they could, and I've indeed bumped into people from Greece who are working on that, who are working on transnational clustering ideas that do not restrain the cooperation in the narrow confines of a region, but sort of adapt the reality that some of their best brains are now living in, I don't know, Dusseldorf or London, and integrate them in that clustering effort. And there are some tools like incubators and so on that can be applied. By the way, I'm, I hope to be able to be hiring next June, but uh, not before that. Uh, uh, and my last, my last uh, answer regarding the, um, uh, the uh, criticism that we haven't talked about uh, enough about uh, solidarity. I am very much in favor of redistribution, but we shouldn't forget that value creation is also the necessary basis of redistribution. And in some of the countries, the problem is not alone that the redistribution is not working as it should, that they are more unjust than they have been, that the Gini coefficient is increasing. The problem is also that the value of creation uh, is under permanent threat and, and even sort of people are falling back. And that so-called competitiveness is not not strong enough. And I think that's why we have to focus our discussion. If we want to build a solid basis for solidarity, we have to focus our discussion on a new development scheme, a new development model that will base, to make it very short, will base competitiveness on sustainability. And if we don't do that, then all the claims that there should be more justice might fall short because the power would be would remain in the hands of those who are standing in the way of that uh, demand. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we are... I think we all are ready for lunch now, but before you can leave this room, I have to ask all of you to take your personal belongings with you because all everything will be rearranged in the lunchtime so that you can, if you come back, just look for your country tables, which are um, uh, all over the first floor. So if you come back in one hour, there will be country tables. The last point is I want to thank all of you very, very much for your contributions, for your remarks, and especially my panelists for your uh, patience and your engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you.